very hard to follow up on that because, quite frankly, that was awesome. It was very inspiring. And now I'm going to get down into talent acquisition, which is, you know, about people, talent, and all of those good things. So I was going to talk about seven uh, tips, but I, I had this eureka moment that I really wanted to be able to share. Nope. Okay, so with regards to talent acquisition, we always hear about the art of business, the art of negotiation, the art of listening, the art of war, even the art of manliness. Um, there is such thing as the art of talent acquisition, and I feel that um, much like the, the, the way of the world, the way talent acquisition is done very, very badly. Now, where do I get this idea from? Well, it was back in 1996. You'll remember that was the year of the Tamagotchi, if you're old enough. Uh, year of Crash Bandicoot, and still we're talking about Crash Bandicoot and the N64. In fact, text messaging, just to, uh, to tie in with what, what we were listening to earlier, text messaging hadn't even been, it wasn't even in the mainstream until 1998. So uh, around about that time in 1996, I was working at Sony Computer Entertainment. We'd just launched PlayStation the year before and I was sitting there looking around and thinking, you know what, there's really something wrong with the talent ecosystem. The way we're acquiring people, the way we're retaining people and the way we're essentially monetizing people from a return on investment side of things. And I really sat there and that's when in 1996 I had my eureka moment that I wanted to move out of brand, I wanted to move, move out of product development, um, I wanted to move out of PR specifically to work more on the human side and, and how humans are actually able to impact companies and, and that development. So fast forward to 2017, where we are now, we've got mixed reality, we've got, and everything is, is transforming digitally and everything is on demand. We just kept, we have an abundance of tech um, at, our thing, at our fingertips. And now, when you look at 2017 and the whole talent ecosystem, things have really evolved, you know, from a talent acquisition perspective, from a retention perspective, from a monetization perspective of talent, hugely. But, we're only going to talk about talent acquisition. And when you think about talent acquisition, you think about recruiters. <laughs> and if you do a Google search, you've probably seen this or you've read articles about this. I've written an article about this. Recruiters are, and the response that Google gives you is not very flattering of recruiters. Um, I decided that I wanted to become a headhunter um, well, I wanted to take that route because I really wanted to bring people together. I wanted to bring amazing people into amazing companies and for them to make beautiful things. So that was my that was my reason for actually getting involved in, uh, in, in or going down that particular path. But I remember before I became a recruiter, I would get a phone call when people would call before they would send me emails. This is before emails. They would call me when I was working and say, oh, I've got this amazing job at Fox. Are you interested? And I'd say, no, I'm really happy here, actually. Thank you very much. No, but I was given your name. You must speak with me. No, I'm really happy. Thanks. No, no. I was told you would speak with me. And it was very aggressive. And I had numerous experiences since then. And that's when I thought, OK, my mission in life, OK, when I die and I have a Facebook me memorial site, it will be her mission was to change the recruitment industry. So today, the industry has changed dramatically, with, um, especially on autom automation. LinkedIn changed the world. Social media changed the world. The way um, recruiters can now reach out to candidates and to p passive or, or, or deeply engaged talent that want to find their next job is, is phenomenal. More technology is now automated, so recruiters don't even need to you know, pick up the phone anymore to make that conversation happen. Um, that is helpful helping recruiters. Uh, you've also got artificial intelligence, uh, intelligence, artificial intelligence. And with artificial intelligence, that whole system is going to be changing radically, I would say, in the next, you're going to see, start seeing stuff in the next year or so, where companies are going to be able to decide very quickly just, just what type of individual is going to work well in that organization. But under, what's going to underpin that is really through assessments as well to try and understand how can you evolve your, your high potentials, how are you able to determine what type of talent are going to fit in, and so on. So these tools are looking really, really good. It's going to really help uh, the way organizations can recruit best to breed in this talent war. So the question is, do we still need recruiters? Uh, 
And I know that a lot of people, when you look at LinkedIn, especially now with their new algorithms, you just have to look at what's happening on the, the LinkedIn page. And you've, you've got people really shaming and, and being angry about their frustrations with, with recruiters, uh, you know, in the technology space, with, with developers, with management, and so on. Because if you've got one job, you've got a thousand applicants, only one will win. You're going to have 999 people who are sorely disappointed. So the question is, do we still need recruiters in the Industrial Revolution? Now bear in mind, we're in the fourth and the fifth Industrial Revolution, depending on which Forbes article you read. As I would say that we're bridging on both, or just 4.5, I don't know. Um, but my, my take on, on uh, do we need recruiters is yes. Yes, we do. But not as we know them. So I am proposing a brand new talent acquisition model. You're hearing it first here. You have a very special audience. The new recruiter is going to be very different. It's going to come from the top down and it's going to come from the side across and it's going to come from the bottom up. It is going to be a revolution. I'd like to call it a revolution, a complete reinvention of the industry. Uh, and it's going to come from the large organizations where there's going to be a care to win model. At the moment, I don't think you would get any impression that a recruiter cares. And that is a significant problem. Uh, it's a problem for the company. It's a problem for the recruiter, recruiter or the recruiting company. And it's a real problem for the, the talent that's being acquired. It makes you feel that it's, it's, it's very transactional, which leads me on to the relationships. Um, recruiters, as well as candidates, look at the recruitment model as being a transactional model. I need a job, can you get me a job, etc. There's going to be a change in those relationships that are really focused on a coaching relationship, co co collaborative, so focusing on collaboration and consultancy. And that will only come via professional development. And professional de development, uh, I did a very quick survey last week to find out if recruiters had professional development in the past few years, and not really. They may have had development uh, focused on social um, search, but had they had any leadership development, any, any abilities to be able to communicate better than, and so on? No, they had not. Uh, but that was a very, very small survey. I'm going to be doing something a little bit more significant later on this year. Also, there's going to be recruiter reinvention. And this is going to come from organizations that are hiring their recruiters, organizations that have recruiters right now and need to be able to evolve their current uh, rec rec recruiter style uh, from an HR perspective. But it really needs to come from the CEOs um, and, and that, that particular level. Uh, and also from recruiters and from people outside that aren't in recruiters. Uh, talking about multidiscipline careers, the people that are going to be moving Moving into this type of environment, uh, I predict, aren't going to be straight recruiters that are just interested in the sale, the thrill of the hunt. They're going to be genuine, genuinely interested in connecting the dots. So when a company is looking for a new department, really what skills are they looking for rather than just throwing resumes and CVs in, in front of the person that uh, is, is hiring. Um, they, so that person understands uniquely what the problem is. Uh, also looking at detective skills. I put detective skills there because one, one, of, one of my personal superpowers is that I am so curious. I want to understand why a company wants to hire somebody and usually the response is, I'm not used to having those kind of questions asked by a recruiter. So the recruiter needs to be a detective. They need to be naturally curious. They're going to potentially be nosy or, or asking questions that are going to make the, the the hiring manager feel awkward. And you know what, that's fine because you need to understand what, you're, what, what type of person you need, to, you need to be able to find. And uniquely, uh, going back to the relationship side, when a recruiter is talking to a candidate, that recruiter can say, you know what, I'm ever so sorry, you're not going to be a right fit for this role because this is what my client or my hiring manager is looking for. So the candidate is able to understand and then move on. Uh, also storytelling. One aspect that's absolutely crucial is that uh, recruiters need to be able to understand the story arc of, of, a, of, a, of a hiring group or a division or a department or the company as well as the industry that they're in and how it impacts the, the world. Um, I love the original, um, the original speaker was talking about how um, journalists are moving into PR and that's how they're able to create money. Actually, journalists would be fast, fantastic in these this type of role because they will interview 
well. They will really have that detective uh, uh, skill set. They, they're going to be thorough. They're going to be able to write up the exact reasons why that person is going to be great and to be able to tell the story. So it's interesting. I was connecting the dots in the previous presentation and actually journalists would be really, really good in this particular role. Also, moving into vision integration, um, this is this is an interesting point because you wouldn't necessarily think of this. But again, this comes from the top. Uh, I recently, as an executive coach, was coaching a company, and this is a this is a regular theme um, that 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 shows up in those executive coaching sessions. Is I give the C-suite this big task, which is I'd like you to go out to your five direct reports and ask them this straight question: What's our mission statement? And nine and a half times out of ten, everybody will have a completely different response, which indicates that information is not going through to the entire organization about really what is our mission, because somewhere along the line, the behaviors within the organization are confusing, their actions are very different, which, believe it or not, impacts on you hiring the right people because everybody's going to have different different mission statements or different understandings or different interpretations. Also, looking at your story in terms of the vision integration, it's this sounds maybe a little bit old school, but it's absolutely important. The best person that does this right now is Mark Zuckerberg in public, as does Elon Musk again in public. Uh, they're very, very open about how they how they talk, you know, how they evolved. When Mark Zuckerberg was at Harvard the other day um, accepting his uh, degree, he at the at the speech he was he he was able to talk about his story, how he started, how he created his first line of code when he was at Harvard, and then later on, you know, and how this has created this this organization and how and how we drive our, our work forward. And ironically, uh, or interestingly, I should say, not ironically, I was talking to a Facebook leader this week when um, headhunting for one of my clients, and uh, a phenomenal leader uh, who was tasked to actually change Facebook the way they work. And this person said, unfortunately, the leader within the organization won't permit that to work because the the story, the values, the mission statement is all focused very much on the engineers failing fast in GSD, getting shit done. So it's it's it, so that's where you have something that's very very conflicting. This is why your story has to match with your behaviors and your mission statement because that will trickle down into the whole area of talent acquisition. So even if you don't have a recruiter, if you don't believe in having a recruiter, that your organization can do that and you can refer people and so on. Also, leadership reinvention. Uh, this is an extension of the vision, uh, vision development that I was talking about. And here with leadership reinvention, one thing that recruiters, the, one of the reasons why recruiters are fundamentally unique is that they are under in incredible pressure. They have to deliver, the, and they're potentially shouted at for not getting those people in those seats fast enough. No excuse is good enough. So they have this they have this loop of of pain every single day, and they're 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 a hamster running on a wheel, trying to you know get get to the other sides. They, they can never be fast enough. There's always going to be positions to um, to place. However, for an, if an organisation actually demonstrates radical candour you're able to get through a lot of that and actually have uh, recruiters that are fundamentally able to sit down and do their job without that stress element. Uh, because when people are stressed, they're not able to perform particularly well. They're not able to manage humans particularly well. And then you get that 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 cycle happening. Um, by the way, I would encourage you um, to read the book by Kim Scott called Radical Candor. It's, it's a game changer. She worked uh, for Sheryl Sandberg at Google. She also um, uh, re she, she does consultancy with Twitter, with Dropbox. She's worked at Apple, uh, and, and her book is absolutely fascinating. I wish that book was available 15 years ago because I would have been a I, I wouldn't have made the awful mistakes that I've made over the past 15 years in terms of human capital development, human management, and everything. So please, please take that opportunity to read it or get the audio book. Also, um, recruiters need to be at the C. They need to be at the C-suite uh, in the C-suite with the C team 
at the table because when the recruiters are able to actually sit with the C-suite, they are again fundamentally able to understand what is needed they're able to think long term and strategically they're able to get into the head of of really where the company is going otherwise again why why are you giving me that cv why are you giving me that resume that's not fitting they they are, they need to be able to connect the dots and again, professional development. I encourage everyone to develop professionally because we're in the fourth and fifth industrial revolution. Te technology is taking over our jobs and everybody, everybody needs to flex their superpowers and improve their emotional intelligence and their, their ability to collaborate and, and develop themselves. So I just touched on technical. Um, recruiters need to focus on technical reinvention. Uh, companies also in the recruitment area need to invest in technical reinvention. AI uh, and all of the different, there's, there's going to be fantastic and phenomenal technologies available in the not too distant future. Please don't ask me in the Q&A what they are. It's going to come out in the wash soon enough. Uh, but you're going to be looking for recruiters to be data analysts. You're going to, to look at the data and to be able to analyze what, what is it that, that you need from a company perspective in the future and they're going to be working more closely with HR usually they're separated which I do not think is a good thing also your recruiter needs to be a marketing specialist they are your brand extension if your recruiter does not know how to hold themselves well and again reflect the company va company values it's not going to work out very well and people won't want to work with your organization and also adaptability uh, this sounds like a no-brainer but you know usually it's it, having somebody that is adaptable to changes within an organization when there's a layoff when there's um, uh, changes within the organization for whatever whatever reason during those transitions recruiters uh, usually are the first out because you don't need to hire um, really, the uh, recruiters need to be able to adapt so they're able to manage the stress and potentially coach people uh, on, on, on the way in and on the way out. So, uh, my very last question, or my question to you, I should say, is what can you do to change your ta talent acquisition culture? It's in all of us to be able to help move companies forward. It isn't just, you can't just rely on recruiters to do this. You can't just rely on a CEO to do this. We all need to be able to move our companies forward and, if, and it's important that we all get involved. So if there's one thing I can ask you to walk away from today is to ask yourself, what can you do to change the way your talent and acquisition process works. Now to the Q&A if anyone has any questions. Hi. So in the process of looking at the candidate, so in the process of looking for a candidate to fill a particular set of roles and you come across talent that doesn't necessarily fit what you're looking for, mm. but is, what do you do with that information as a recruiter? Well, I, I have a different model and a process. So for people that didn't hear, um, the, the question was, what do you do with candidates that uh, don't fit that particular role? So if, if a candidate, so I'm a headhunting person, uh, specialist, so we actually reach out to candidates versus put a job on a job board and then receive maybe 2,000 applications. So the process is, is that we identify the talent and we will reach out to people that we believe are going to be a good fit. Nine out of ten, they're a good fit, you know, or, you know, maybe things don't go so well and maybe they're not a good fit for whatever reason. But you usually identify that at interview stage or so the timings are wrong or the, 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 the finances are aren't right. So in terms of letting people down, I think what you're trying to get to is if they're not the right fit, but they're interested in moving forward, how do you deal with them? Is that, yep? And how do you take somebody who maybe falls outside here and you're looking for them? Oh, okay. So, so something with them, or do you forget about them? Or do you oh, yes, absolutely. So, the, the, I have a number of answers f for you there. So, in terms of the the wonderful unicorns that we might approach, they're not the right fit. We'll have that conversation with them and say, you know what, our client is looking for an analytics person that has information or experience in archaeology, SAP. I'm making this up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, ISO 9000 compliant and uh, knows how to um, and, 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 and speaks Russian. 
completely unrelated to this industry. I wanted to make a point of that. So, uh, so when you look at that particular ridiculous scenario and that person doesn't speak Russian, that's going to be a deal breaker. So we'll say to the person, I'm really sorry, it's important. This, this role is, means they're going to be dealing with only Russian engineers. It's not a good idea to be able to get a translator here because if you get a translator, you're, you're, you're upsetting that the, the bond that is created with that particular culture. You know, you need to be able to explain it coherently. And that's going back to understanding the culture, understanding the job, understanding the company, understanding the values. Like if, if you didn't know that actually with a Russian team that you can only get that trust and you can actually do an archaeology, archaeology dig in that particular area once you had that trust, it wouldn't happen. And the uh, terrible spectre wearing a hat of doom and time up. So I must go, but if you want to, I can answer, I, I would ha be happy to answer any of these questions if you want to do this outside. Thank you, yes, I must, I'm done. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Anna, that was great. Thank you. Uh,